I'm going to uh, share with you a few ideas that have come from my work for the last 32 years in a social enterprise, the first social enterprise in the world dedicated to sustainable development. What is sustainable development? Very briefly, sustainable development is eradicating poverty and bringing back the health of the environment. Those are the two cornerstones, two legs on which all development becomes sustainable. So let me uh, first start by saying the past two centuries, humanity has made incredible progress. Uh, the way we live, where we live, how we live, the mobility, the communications, the knowledge that we get, all of these are available to the average person in the street. 200 years ago, even the richest person in the world didn't have these. During these two centuries, we've made incredible progress. All our lives are better, more healthy, longer, and more fulfilled. But in the process, we have started to create huge amounts of trouble for our lives, our own lives, and for the life of our planet. We've got many, many different crises, species extinction, poverty, a variety of other things. But I'm going to talk to you about the most biggest issue right now, mainly because the world is treating it like that, which is climate change. The climate, as you all know, is changing rapidly. The temperatures of the Earth are rising. The deserts of the world are growing. This graph shows natural disasters exploding in the last 110 years. This is uh, an amazing phenomenon. And uh, as you know, most of our species are, many of our species are under great threat, including the national animal. But we're losing 100 times as many species today uh, than we did, than we do in the background rate. In fact, we're actually losing species faster than the time when the dinosaurs disappeared. So we have people now being displaced by a variety of environmental causes, including climate change. We have now also to understand what we've got to do about it. We all know that uh, climate change is caused by uh, greenhouse gases, mainly carbon dioxide, methane, and similar gases, which entrap the heat within the atmosphere. And these are caused by burning fossil fuels, mainly. There are many, many hard problems, but the belief that my organization started with 32 years ago is there are also many feasible solutions. And I'm going to be talking today about <coughs> the kinds of solutions. In this case, in the case of climate change, it means reducing the emission of carbon, which means many different things, which I will just come to. About a month ago, as you know, uh, the governments of the world, 195 governments, most of them represented by the heads of state, their prime ministers, their presidents, came together in Paris and they agreed that we would basically make commitments at the country level which will all add up for the world to be kept below 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial eras. In other words, we cannot allow the world to get hotter than that without getting into catastrophic endgame. For life. And most of the work, as you know, uh, is taken on by governments and by businesses, and a large part of it has to be done by big organizations. And these organizations are different kinds and they have different views. There are people in the north, the colors uh, colored blue here, uh, industrialized countries which have caused the problem over the last 200 years, got the benefits of those uh, massive use of, of energy. Uh, and say, well, you know, now we don't want to change our lifestyles. Uh, why don't you in the South, the poor people, uh, try and cut down on your use of, uh, of energy? The people in the South, the ones colored in orange, say, uh, we've got to improve the lives of our people. We have to use more energy. So there is this tutu mamai going on, which essentially makes it virtually impossible for you to come to agreements. But in Paris, we sort of did. 
uh, we said all countries will have to take responsibility. Of course, the North, the industrialized rich countries would take more, but we now need to do a new kind of mathematics. Now, the rest of what I'm going to talk about is solutions that people like my own organization, people like you in this audience and elsewhere can actually do to say, help save the planet. Uh, mitigating climate change needs a new mathematics, and I'm going to indulge you into a little bit of classroom work. Uh, the mathematics of carbon emissions is quite simple, actually. Uh, the total amount of carbon emitted depends, basically, on the amount of carbon emitted for a unit of energy. It also depends on the, the amount of energy uh, emitted for a unit of service, which is like transport or heating or cooking, which is then multiplied again by the amount of service, this transport, cooking, or whatever, per person, per capita. And that is multiplied by the total population, and you get the total amount of carbon being sent out into the atmosphere. Simple mathematics. As you can see, any of you who've done simple mathematics, the, the, the denominators cancel out with the next numerator, and you end up with carbon uh, amount of carbon for the whole world. Uh, there is a nice negative to that, and we call it sequestration, which is the amount of carbon being absorbed by forests, by algae in the oceans, by soils, and so on. So this is the total uh, equation. We call it carbon intensity, the first term. The second term is the energy intensity. The third term is the service intensity, and then population for the total scale, and then you minus the removal. And in mathematical terms, you can put it into symbols. And what it amounts to is that we find very strong, uh, by separating these terms out, possibilities for finding strategic solutions. Uh, some are by substitution, by energy sources which are less carbon intensive. Some of it is by efficiency, by reducing the amount of energy needed to do something. Some of it is by lifestyle changes, particularly in the land of Gandhi, I can say, the idea of sufficiency, what is enough, do you really need more, uh, and then uh, multiplied by the total population, and then you minus out the forests and the algae and so on. So this is basically what you've got to do, and in, in a sense there are four big options, technology, lifestyles, population, and nature. Now I'm going to suggest that we individuals in our communities and our organizations can do something on each one of these four, and I'm going to give you quick examples on how we can do that. Governments, as I said, take on the big responsibilities, the policies, the actions, the big large-scale reforestation projects, the energy efficiency in industry. That's being done by governments and by corporations. The first big term, first two big terms and the last term uh, are often done by public and private organizations. But what can we do? They, for example, renewable energy. They, they can reduce large-scale renewable energy. Uh, they can introduce large-scale renewable energy and reduce carbon emissions at a cost of something like 20 to 30 dollars, US dollars, per ton of carbon reduced. I'm going to give you most of my figures in what is called abatement costs. How much does it cost to reduce one ton of carbon emitted into the atmosphere. And we will compare all these together. Another way is forests. Forests, again, cost somewhere between 30 to $50, and you can reduce a ton of carbon by sequestering that into trees. Uh, there is a big uh, movement towards large-scale geoengineering called carbon capture and storage, which is the idea that you capture the carbon coming out of the power stations and so on, and shoving it down into Mother Earth, into mines, used mines, and so on. And this is called CCS, Carbon Capture Storage. And that costs somewhere around 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 dollars per ton saved. So this is the kind of summary. And at Paris, countries came together and made commitments which they claimed would cost something of the order of 350 billion, one third of a trillion dollars about one-third of India's GDP uh, per year uh, to introduce these things for every year till 2030. It's a lot of money. 
may be affordable if you stop having armaments and wars and so on, but it's big. So, I think we need to now also add to what governments and corporations do by ourselves changing our lives, our livelihoods, our lifestyles, and that's the middle two terms in which we can have an impact on things which I'm going to show you right now. So here is the growth of net carbon emissions. Net means after the sequestration in forests and so on. And this is the way it has been growing. Uh, we are at 7 gigatons today at 2015. And if we continued business as usual, we would go on to 14, 15, and the world would basically fry. What Paris did was basically say, enough is enough, we're going to change things, and we're going to keep it growing for another 20, uh, 15 years, roughly to about 9 gigatons, and then we must either level off or even come down, uh, and we will have to come down if we want to keep it within 1.5 degrees centigrade, which will cost even more. So here is the basic graph, and you don't have to see that big gap between 14 and 9 gigatons, billion tons per year, uh, as a one silver bullet thing. It can't be done by one action. It has to be done by many. So we split them up into uh, wedges, and we then get basically things like technology, lifestyles, population, and so on, uh, that we can do. We have to now go through this uh, transition, which actually takes a long time for countries to get more and more efficient, because it costs more, by doing some leapfrog stuff to turn it around and use disruptive approaches, disruptive interventions, which are, in a sense, not only leapfrog, but horse jump. We have to go into a totally different way. The uh, theme of our uh, TED conference today, which is uh, basically uh, the metamorphosis that the Indian culture can introduce, is about the leapfrog and the horse jump. So let us look at these. These are different wedges that I put in there to show you that we can do different, different things which all add up. And here is one. This picture is the headquarters. The building is the headquarters of my organization in Delhi, in South Delhi, near IIT Delhi. This building has been made entirely out of industrial waste, recycled materials, fly ash from power stations, mud. It's, it's nice enough for multinationals to want to rent space in it, but it reduced the cost uh, of, of uh, the building as well as the cost of carbon emitted uh, by a massive amount, by nearly $30 to save one ton of carbon. We saved money. We actually save money while saving carbon. We've developed a new cement called low carbon cement, which is competing, which will, I hope, compete one day with Portland and, and, and Pozzolona cement, uh, which is made really out of mining wastes, which is cheap, but better, and much, more, much lower carbon. So here is a wedge. I've got a lifestyle wedge over there, which comes from this basic idea that we have a low cost building. Now, you can do the same with agroforestry. Agroforestry for small farms, we call it wadi. Uh, you can do planting trees and, and plants in such a way that the cost of saving a carbon is, up to, is down to around 15 to $20 uh, t dollars per ton. See, it's much cheaper for us to do things than for governments. So here you have natural capital and another wedge. So we're gradually coming down from 14 gigatons towards 9 by adding different kinds of things. Population. Let me give you an example of how population, how our individual decisions can make a difference. If you plot the fertility, the number of children a woman has on the y-axis, and you plot GDP or Human Development Index on the x-axis, you see an incredible correlation. You see that? That correlation is 0.85. R squared, 0.85. It's almost causal. The poor have a lot of children. The rich have very few. You know that from your own lives. 
Basically, if you look at this map, this is a very special kind of a map. The size of the country goes as big as the parameter it's describing. So this shows total births, and you will see the total births in India and China are much, much bigger, for example, than in the US or in Europe. So the country size represents basically that parameter. So let me show you a picture. This is the one for total births. And these two are for the girls not at school, and you see they're almost identical, and the illiterate women, almost identical. These are positively correlated. You got girls not in school, or illiterate women, you got lots and lots of births. On the other hand, if you have higher women's income, or you have higher uh, female work managers, you get negative correlation. You see them much smaller. India is tiny because the women's income is very low here. So either you have positive correlation and deal with those issues, put girls in school, they take longer to get married, they have more aspirations, they have a desire to work, and that means more, fewer kids. We give women a chance to take charge of their lives, they will have fewer children. So basically on the basis of this, you can do an analysis, which we did. My organization has been doing a lot of work on this. And you can see that the jobs created, the empowerment, the factory, factories, even government, panchayats, and so on, um, we lead to empowerment. Empowerment and jobs and livelihoods, which lead to a motivation for smaller families. You don't have to advertise uh, contraception. Development is the best contraceptive. It happens on its own. So we made a model. My colleague and I did a system dynamics model, a very sophisticated one, as you can see on the, the equations. We basically uh, were able to show that you could save six, you could save carbon by livelihoods and, uh, and, uh, for women and uh, education for girls. In the case of education for girls, you save uh, one ton of carbon for six to fifteen dollars. Much, much cheaper. In the case of uh, uh, jobs for women, livelihoods, you were able basically to save a, even better. We had a factory in which we have a factory in Bundelkhand near Jhansi, where we've been able to show that women who are working have twelve times fewer children than the control group with the same age, the same income, the same cost. Uh, society. So this model basically showed us that by the year 2050 or so, you could save one billion people on this planet simply by putting girls to school and creating jobs for women. The total savings in the process of carbon is huge. And I will just show you, this is the, the wedge for the population. Now, these wedges don't complete the whole gap. Some of we have to leave some work for the governments and for big companies. But you can see that a huge amount of work, uh, work towards uh, reducing carbon emissions can, can take place. And here are the comparisons. Those were the conventional ones I showed you in the box. Forests, energy efficiency, carbon capture and storage. And these are the out of the box ones. Uh, jobs for women, and when they're red, they actually save money as well as save carbon. This is a double whammy. In fact, you can actually make money by saving carbon in those two cases. In the other cases, they're much cheaper. You can see how much cheaper they are depending on what technology or sustainable agriculture or, or, or girls' schools. So we share one planet. Um, we're going to need, if we go on the way we are, uh, something of the order of three planets, and we don't have them. So we now basically have to remember what Gandhiji said, uh, and that was uh, be the change that you want to see. Thank you.